So whereas if you actually look at, uh, in this case I was talking about the Pyramid of Unus, and how in the pyramid text the inscriptions tend to be just listed, but they, they don't tell you uh, which bend in the corridor of the pyramid the inscription came from. That actually, uh, if knowing that, actually sheds light on the connotation of the inscription itself, whether it's on the north side or the east side or what have you. It actually tells you a lot about the meaning, so it changes the meaning of what you're reading by knowing what the, what the context of the life world was that this information came out of. Science tends to leave these things out of account. By science, we mean in the larger sense, archaeology and the history of art and so forth. These, these contextual factors do tend to get left out of account. So I think Heidegger is on to something here when he says that the, this, the world space of science that it creates is pure homogenous spatiality, which is indifferent to where an object sits in the world and how it sits in that world and why it sits in that world, tends to get left out of account. I, I think it's a very good and an important point. And the same thing with, with the human life world. It matters where things are at. And my concern, uh, as I am involved in the world, actually uh, determines what, how near something is for me. For example, uh, the friend that is walking toward me up the street, because of my concern for him, may be nearer to me than the actual street underneath my feet, in that sense. It's concern that creates the importance of what is spatially near and what is spatially far from us in the world. So, in the world, orientation, remoting, and region are more important than this abstract, homogenous way uh, that science decontextualizes the world by laying uh, an objective grid upon it. Uh, it just doesn't take context into account. So I think this is an excellent point that Heidegger makes. Um, <clears throat> now he finishes the first half of, of the book on the, uh, the worldhood of the world by uh, shifting to an analysis of the who of Dasein. So the who of Dasein then has to do with Dasein, of course, the who of Dasein is, is the human being. The human being is Dasein. And uh, it's worth remarking here that um, starting with Heidegger, we begin to get the disintegration of the subject uh, that eventually leads in postmodern thought to the dis to, to total dismantling with uh, philosophers like Deleuze and Foucault uh, of the subject altogether. But with Heidegger, the subject uh, begins to disappear into almost into a collective entity. It's almost as though Dasein were a we, and although a we embedded in a world, in the world, rather, um, a, a collective entity. Uh, and the I disappears into I-ness. The ego becomes egoicity. The self becomes selfhood in Heidegger. So these are ways of talking about how the human self is as a, as a, as a mode of being in the world, not how my self is, not how I am, not how the subject as a cogito exists. So Heidegger is already beginning, the er, we can already see here, the earliest beginnings of the destabilization and dismantling of the subject that later turns up full thrust after World War II with French postmodern thought, with Derrida and Deleuze. In Deleuze, the subject becomes a mere collective uh, assemblage of enunciation uh, involved in this world of assemblages that, that he is a part of, assemblages and flows in the society of which he's a part. And in Foucault, the subject is dismantled and becomes simply a creation of the I individual institutions that have subjectivized him, that create him through charts and maps and diagrams and records that keep track of him as he moves through the system. Uh, so Foucault dismantles the subject by uh, dissolving him into the, into the network of the institutions of the disciplinary society that have created him. Uh, but then as, as you move into late postmodern philosophy, which is to say contemporary philosophy now, with figures like Alain Badiou and uh, Slavoj Žižek, those guys are trying to retrieve uh, the subject from this French postmodern dismantling that was, as we were seeing here, it was initiated by Heidegger. They try to retrieve the subject, and Badiou does it specifically by saying that it is our fidelity to an event, and he means event with a capital E, in which a cultural singularity of, of some sort occurs, and he uses set theory in his book Being and Time to discuss this. In set theory, we have um, we have these sets, and then when an anomaly erupts that is not that does not belong to the situation, then you have a singularity. And he transposes this to culture to refer to the singularities of uh, you know Einsteinian relativity as a singularity, a novelty that springs up and is brand new and marks a rupture in physics that initiates a whole line of, of status quo. Uh, or whether it's classical music, uh, the rupture that begins with Haydn, uh, and you get this new style of classical music that goes on down through Beethoven. Um, 
or you know whether it's you know Saint Paul creating Christianity as a singularity, a, a rupture in the Roman world. In each case, uh, the gr the people that uh, dedicate themselves through fidelity to this event actually recreate themselves as subjects. So it is our fidelity to an event, uh, our staying true to our truth event, that subjectivizes us and creates a valid subject. So this is Badiou's, Badiou's way of, of retrieving this fallen subject from uh, French postmodern theory, and Zizek more or less follows him in this. Uh, the ticklish subject is, is the book that uh, Zizek discusses this in. Uh, <clears throat> so Dasein, then, anyway, <clears throat> is this this sort of there is a collective aspect to, to Dasein because it's the human being in the world as a species as a mode of, of being to which uh, all these different structural phenomena being in being with anxiety care concern are part of the essence of the human mode of being in the world no matter where he is uh, and in this sense it's kind of similar to Buddhism Buddhism has a similar analysis of the self motivated by fear and desire regardless of where you're at it's, it's always the same energies that are moving us. Same thing with early Heidegger here. Um, so the who uh, of, of the being in the world um, is, that, that's the who, the, the Dasein is, is, is the one. And, uh, but the, the average everydayness of Dasein is this phenomenon that he calls the anyone. The anyone, uh, which is also translated as the they, thus man. The anyone is the average everydayness of Dasein such that um, it's the sort of average crowd phenomenon effect in which everyone does what everyone else does. That's what the anyone is. The, the anyone is the subject of everydayness and can live one's own Dasein through its averageness. And some of the constitutive properties of the anyone are apartness, as he says, which is what happens when uh, individuals compete with each other. There, there's always this one-upsmanship amongst people and that creates this uh, constitutive structural phenomenon of apartness. Then there's this, the averageness uh, that belongs with this and the leveling down of values and estimations. There's a kind of tyranny that the, that the anyone exerts upon the Dasein, exerts upon the individual to conform and go along with what everyone else is doing. Um, that's the average everydayness that is, that is um, in the mode of the anyone that is the main threat to the authenticity of Dasein, to living an authentic life, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. But that's uh, the who of Dasein. And so then he moves into the second half of his analysis here, which is the last third of the book, where he talks about the basic dispositions of Dasein, which, which are to say the, the moods. And there are four main ones that he's concerned with. Uh, discoveredness, and discoveredness will have to do with both mood and understanding. And then he'll talk about also, uh, in addition to discoveredness, the, uh, the fallenness and the uncanniness uh, of Dasein and also care. So those four modes are what he spends the last third of the book talking about. Now, with regard to discoveredness, then, he says that discoveredness is the way that the human being finds himself in the world and is the act of disclosure of one's situation in the world to oneself. And it has to do with moods, which he also calls attunements or, or dispositions. Moods always change our attitude to the world and they have a great deal to do, whether it's anxiety or boredom or what have you, they have a great deal to do with, with how we are at a particular time and place. So mood is part of the constitutive aspect of this discoveredness of Dasein. The other aspect has to do with understanding. Earlier he talked about knowing, but he says that understanding is different from knowing in that uh, understanding is exclusive, an exclusive property that belongs to Dasein, and understanding has to do with uh, interpretation, it has to do with hermeneutics. Understanding uh, is part of, it's rooted in discoveredness. Discoveredness is the ground that makes understanding possible. And interpretation uh, enacts the being of understanding, and understanding in turn enacts the being of discoveredness through uh, questioning things and finding out how they're possible. For example, when a child comes up to me and says, what is this thing? And you give the ex explanation of the thing to the child, then it becomes possible for that thing to enter into the child's environing world. So objects actually do not apresent themselves. This is the word that he uses at this point before he's using unconcealed later on. Objects apresent themselves in our environing world once we understand them. So when we have an understanding of what this thing is by defining what it does, uh, this, this hammer uh, is, a ha is a tool for nailing things. Now in my understanding of it, it enters into my environing world a as an entity, as, as a being, as something to be regarded. It's, it's part of the environing world. 
And then um, another aspect of, uh, of the dispositions of discoveredness uh, is idle talk. But idle talk uh, is more, though he talks about it here, he also talks about it in the next section on fallenness. And fallenness is the next constitutive disposition of Dasein, fallenness. Dasein finds itself in a state of fallenness in the world, and there, in this book he talks about three aspects of fallenness, idle talk, uh, curiosity, and ambiguity. And he says that these are the things that dissipate Dasein's energies into the world, that, that drain authenticity out of him. Uh, and elsewhere in another essay he talks about how the basic tendency of Dasein is to disperse itself throughout the world, to lose itself in its involvements with the world. And so, in this case, um, the first thing that he talks about for fallenness is idle talk, and idle talk actually covers up phenomena. It has the, the effect of covering things up by passing along gossip, cliches, mere opinions about things that have not been thought through. And he says that this goes for the uh, sciences as well as it does for the average everyday person engaged in conversation about something. It also, a lot of what goes on, he says, at conferences, scientific con conferences, is a pretense of understanding that just passes along bad ideas, and we end up at these conferences with a lot of cliches that actually end up concealing phenomena in their true essence. Uh, I think we can s extend this to the academic world generally and say that a lot of what goes on there is a covering up of phenomena because there's a conspiracy in such a world not to allow new ideas to come in. And by keeping new ideas out, there's a conspiracy to conceal phenomena and to keep them stuck in a st <clears throat> status quo mode of thinking. Descartes experienced this. Uh, every great thinker experienced it. You know, when Descartes was writing uh, and the academy was stuck in Aristotle, he, he had a hard time getting those ideas out of his head. And then when his own philosophies about science became uh, accepted, uh, that made it very difficult for Newton to get his ideas accepted and so on. So every, all the great thinkers um, have to endure this, this process of, of bringing in the new thing that ruptures through the idle, the idle talk that tends to disperse um, Dasein's energies. The other thing he says is that, is that um, curiosity is another problem that contributes to the fallen nature of Dasein. And by curiosity, he, may, he basically means this constant rushing off toward the new thing. Uh, curiosity is this constant what we would call today ADD, channel surfing, always running off to the new thing, the new, new thing, so that we're constantly in a state of distraction and we can never collect ourselves and we're constantly dispersing our energies out into the world. Uh, you know, like the social butterfly is an example of this who goes from party to party and constantly thrusts themselves into the unfamiliar and accumulates the unfamiliar in their lives and they ended up in a permanent state of distraction. So this is part of Dasein's flight from itself uh, in this process of dispersal. And then ambiguity is involved in this, in trying to guess. There, there's a social ambiguity and always trying to guess what the other person is thinking, how much they know, how much, how authentic their understanding of something really is. And so the whole thing involves an entanglement of Dasein, a fall of Dasein into the world that, that entangles Dasein and dissipates its energies and creates inauthenticity. Now, uh, Heidegger's vision here is not that far away from the Gnostic idea that the soul has fallen into the world as a spark of light that is caught in matter. Hans Jonas was one of Heidegger's pupils, and he wrote the best book on Gnosticism still, uh, the Gnostic religion. And uh, he himself points this out in that book, that Heidegger's idea of fallenness is, is similar to the, the, we're fallen in the mass spectacle. You have to envision the time that Heidegger is writing this is the time when our cities are giant megalopolises now. Um, and you know, we've reached a billion, the population has reached a billion by, by the year 1800 for the first time in history. And we have these huge massive crowds. And the crowds are determining now what the culture industry does, what everyone is said to read and supposed to read. And we have the, the threat of the, the mass man here that Heidegger is trying to counter in writing this little book in this small quiet German town in this tiny little cabin in the, in the, in the Black Forest. He's trying to counter this this massive phenomenon of, the, of these megalopolitan cities and their, their giant populations where people lose themselves in inauthenticity. They, they disperse themselves through crowds and do what everybody else does. They do what it, one is said to do. Uh, one takes a job for the money rather than because one has an authentic interest in it. That's an inauthentic lie. Uh, it's similar actually to Joseph Campbell's idea of following your bliss. 
though I don't want to degrade Heidegger here by attaching him to what itself is, is a social cliche that's part of the idle chatter of the media that dissipates authenticity. I think that, that phrase is one of those types of phrases. Um, <clears throat> so that's idle talk and curiosity. 